Sorry, a little bit of a rush this morning. Okay, so scripture reading today, if you turn with me, it's going to be Psalm 23. And I am going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible Version. Okay, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love, loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God bless the word. Good morning. Matt did an excellent job yesterday introducing our new chapel series, The Shema. Now, to jog our memories, I want to read through that one more time. <clears throat> uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, we find these words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. The word Shema, Matt shared with us yesterday, means not just to hear, but to listen. We remember that, right? It is to listen with the intent of obeying. It is to listen with the intent of carrying out what is being commanded to us. And so our approach to God isn't just one of allowing his words to reverberate against our eardrums, not just the act of hearing, right, which is an innate ability to uh, pick up the sounds that are in our environment. It is more than that. It is rather listening being attentive to the message that is being communicated to us. And Matt even shared that words don't even need to be spoken necessarily for listening to happen, right? We know that as humans, even in the animal kingdom, if you will, communication takes various forms. You can communicate, yes, verbally through words, but we also communicate through body language, do we not? right? Facial expressions. There's a whole host of ways that we communicate. And so what, what the Shema is telling us is that, hey, listen, God is trying to tell you something. Pay attention. God is trying to tell you something. Listen. Understand the message. Now, if you're married, okay, you understand this dynamic perhaps even better than our single friends, okay? When you're in communication with your wife or with your husband, you ought to listen right? Not just hear the words coming out of the other person, but listen to what is being said. Understand the message that is being communicated. Sometimes, sometimes what we think, what we think the other person is saying is not at all what the other person is saying, is it? And, and we've experienced that. If not yet, you probably will. Milo and Ruth are here this morning. I'm sure they're going to begin to experience a lot more of that in the days, in the days ahead. But that is listening, right? It is this cultivated skill. It is something we have to work at. Because like Matt exhorted us towards the end of his sermon yesterday, sometimes we, we are tempted to just sort of read through the words of God, read through what he's saying, allowing, really just picking up the sounds, but not really yielding our hearts over to him. And that's what he really wants. So, so the Shema is this Jewish prayer that the Jews to this day recite twice a day. It is arguably the most important prayer in Jewish life. They recite it once in the morning, once in the evening, at special occasions, um, at feasts, even as a person's last dying words. Very important. The Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love him with all your heart, with all your soul, 
and with all your strength. Today we focus on the object of Shema. In other words, we know that we ought to listen, we understand that we ought to listen, we ought to pay attention, we ought to pick up the message that is being communicated to us, but to whom do we listen? Well, we listen to the Lord. We listen to Yahweh. Now this is the God of the Bible. This is the covenant God of the Israelites, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. In the original Hebrew alphabet, um, they only used consonants, okay? That's not, I won't go into the details of how the Hebrew language works, but for the most part, okay, uh, text was p primarily in consonants, and the sounds of the vowels were communicated uh, through oral tradition. It was passed down from person to person. But a problem that the Jews encountered was that they considered the name of God Yahweh, sacred, so sacred that they avoided pronouncing it. And so they would, they would substitute instead other words, okay, and we'll get to that in a minute. But, but they did not want to, they believed that this name was actually unpronounceable and that it shouldn't be pronounced. And so they avoided using this word. Instead, they used the letters Y-H-W-H. Now, in modern Hebrew, it would be Y H. V H. It's the in the Hebrew alphabet. It's Yod, He, Vav, He. Those are the four letters. But after a time of omitting that sound, after a prolonged time of omitting that sound, tradition has it that that they forgot how the word was actually pronounced. And so along comes another group called the Masoretes. Okay, and they say, well, we need to really figure out how to pronounce this word again. Okay, we've forgotten it. Well, a word that they used in place of Yahweh was Adonai, which meant master or king. And it could also refer to a person. So what they, what they did, and long, to make a long story short, they substituted, well, they inserted the vowels from the word Adonai, A, O, and A, into these four letters to come up with Yahovah. Okay? Note the resemblance to the word Jehovah. Okay? Or more correctly, we come with the word Yahweh. Now, the Greeks, they call this, sorry, the Greeks, they use the word kurios, okay? And they refer to this four-letter word of the Hebrews as the tetragrammaton, okay? What does that mean? It just means consisting of four letters, very enlightened of our Greek friends, okay? So, so they use the word kyrios, okay, to, to refer to God. But this morning, this is not at all what we're going to focus on. Okay? My intention is not to, have, to nerd out on language and linguistics. Okay? It is great to know all of these little details about how these different languages work, how they came up with the words that we have today. That's great, but that's not really the focus of our lesson this morning. Rather, I want to focus on, I want us to grapple with the fact that our God gave himself a name and what that means for us. What does the Lord mean? What, what, this act of God giving himself a personal name, what does that mean for us? See, a name is a deeply personal thing. To share your name is a relational act. What are names for? Well, they help us identify ourselves, and they also help us distinguish ourselves from others. A name communicates not just the sound that it makes when you say it, Princeton, Paul, Tim, Milo, Daryl, but it also communicates a whole host of things about that person, does it not? It communicates to us that person's values, their beliefs, their interests, their likes, their dislikes, their fears. And so to share your name is a deeply personal thing, and God shares his name with us. What does that tell us about him? Well, it tells us that he is a relational God and that he wants to be in relationship with us. It tells us that he is knowable, that we can, in fact, if we seek him, we will find him, and we can know him just as we are known by him. You know, contrast this for a second with, with a couple of... Uh, contrast this with the Muslim God, Allah, for a moment. You know... There are epithets that Muslims use. There are 99 referring to Allah, 
and his attributes. They would call him Allah the compassionate, for example. They would call him Allah the merciful. But strangely enough, Allah as love, that's not really a thing. Okay? Kind of curiously enough, uh, we know our God as love, do we not? Now, what does that tell us? Okay? So this relationship that Muslims have with Allah is not similar to the relationship that Christians have with Yahweh. We have a personal relationship. We have a relationship where we know our God, where we can know him as a person. The Muslims don't have that. What about the Hindus? They worship a supreme being called Brahma. Okay? Now, they have a whole pantheon of deities, okay? 330 million. If you're wondering, that's the population of the United States. Okay? There are 330 million deities in the Hindu pantheon. But they are all, if you will, incarnations of this one supreme being, Brahma. Does that sound personal to you? Does that sound like a God who's accessible to you? Does that sound like a God who is interested in you, in your affairs? Not to me. But what about Yahweh? I am, he says. He says, hey, listen, you can know me by this name. I am. <clears throat> what does Yahweh mean then? It means, it is a way of saying the self-existent one or the self-existing one. And what does that mean? It means that God, that Yahweh is eternal. That he did not have a beginning and he does not have an end. Now, to our feeble human faculties, that is an incomprehensible thing, right? Because everything that we know, everything that is in our, in our realm of consciousness, Everything has a cause. Everything has a beginning and everything has an end. We ourselves have a beginning, or rather had a beginning, and we will have an end, right? But God is unlike us. God is unlike all of the rest of creation in that he has always existed. There was, no, there was nothing and there was no one that brought him into existence. There was nothing that caused God. There was nothing that created God. He has just always existed. He's eternal. He's a self-existing one. He is Yahweh. That is what it means. He wasn't I was. He says I am. I am. He's always existed. Now he, in his gr grace, allows us to participate in that eternal nature. He says, hey, if you believe in my son, you will live with me for eternity, right? But some people would refer to God as uh, people that don't really believe in God, they would refer to this philosophical idea as the first cause or the prime mover, okay? The first cause of the universe before whom there was no other cause, okay? Who was not created by any other cause. So that's what this word Yahweh means. When God says, I am, he is saying, I am. I was yesterday, yes, but I am now and I will be tomorrow. This word appears close to 6,800 times in scriptures. Okay. The Lord. And you'll see that in your Bibles. In fact, at the, at the, in the, towards the beginning of your Bibles, there's typically a section that outlines sort of the translation philosophy of whatever version you're using. Okay. And in there, you'll actually find this, that when the word Lord is used in all caps, it is, it is in place of the word Yahweh. Okay. It is in place of the word Yahweh. I mean, it is incredible. I know we, we read our Bibles a lot, but Seldom do we go to those introductory notes and see sort of, it, it's very illuminating if you do that. So take a minute to do that, maybe this, today, this week. <clears throat> so God identifies himself as Yahweh for the first time in Exodus chapter 3. I'd like for you to accompany me there. Do you want time? <clears throat> Exodus chapter 3. find my spot here. So, really quickly here. Remember Moses, okay, born of a Hebrew woman for fear of his life, okay? Uh, his mama put him in a little basket, sent him down river. He's found by the princess, is raised in the palace, okay, in the Egyptian palace, okay? And when one day when he's grown, Moses sees an Egyptian mistreating one of his fellow Hebrews, what does he do? He kills him. Well, he finds out that that is now common knowledge, or at least people have found out about that, and he flees, right? 
like a good man taking responsibility, he just runs away from it, okay? And where does he run to? He goes to the middle of nowhere. He goes to the desert of Midian, to the east, okay? And, and where we find him here in Exodus chapter 3 is he's tending to the flocks, of Jethro, his father-in-law. Okay, he's working for his father-in-law in the middle of nowhere, not surrounded by people, but look at what happens in chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Verse 3, And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And now jump over to verse 13. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Because God wants to commission Moses. He wants to send send him to Pharaoh to bring his people out. Moses has a whole host of questions. He says, what do I tell them about who sent me? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Man. Think, think of that, that moment, Moses, with all of his fears, with his reticence, with his hesitation, with his, uh, I don't know, I don't know about unwillingness. I think he was willing, but he was scared. He was fearful. Is this going to work? When I come to Pharaoh, I mean, it's not like he's just some average Joe Pharaoh. He's the ruler of the greatest empire at the time, right? He's the most powerful man on the planet, and you're wanting me to go to him and say, Let my people go, right? How's that going to work? And what about the people, the the Hebrews? Are they going to listen to me? Okay, They're going to surely ask me, well, who sent you? Who are you? Who made you Lord over us? You remember that question? Was asked about him 40 years prior. Who are you? Who sent you? In whose authority do you come? And God says, tell them, I am that Yahweh sent you. See, what we see in the Old Testament is time and again, and we're not going to go through the story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt, but you remember how God delivered them out of Egypt, don't you? Ten plagues? Ten plagues? We're still coping, trying to cope and deal with one here. Okay. Ten plagues. Imagine the hardness of Pharaoh's heart to endure that much, to allow his people to endure that much. And yet God said, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. The Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh and that there is no God, no other God beside me. And so he delivers the Israelites with mighty acts of power, right? With an outstretched arm, the scriptures say. Okay? He, he has the Israelites cross over the Red Sea on dry ground, and then as the Egyptians tried to cross, what happened? The waters came rushing in on them, flooded them, drowned them, right? And, and when they were about to enter the promised land, were they the most powerful, mighty fighting force there was? No, they were not. So how did they win their battles? How did they take over a city like Jericho and devote it to destruction if it wasn't for Yahweh going ahead of them? Think of all the needs that Yahweh supplied his people. And were they deserving of his help? Man. What, what was the people's response to Yahweh? What was the people's response to, I am in your midst, in a pillar of fire by night and a cloud and a, call a pillar of cloud by day? What was their response to that? Ah, we had meat in Egypt. <laughs> right? Like, Did you bring us out to the desert to die here, Moses? That was their response, was it not? And God put up with it. He put up with it. He never stopped being I am for them. Isn't that amazing? He's a good God. He's a gracious God. He supplied all of their needs because he was their covenant God. He wasn't going to leave them by the wayside. He made a promise to them and he, is, he always keeps his promises, unlike humans. 
And so regardless of their unfaithfulness to him, God was always faithful to his people. He was always I am, Yahweh to his people. He was always there to supply all of their needs because he desired this intimate relationship with them. He made a covenant with them and he kept the covenant with them. That is the sort of God that he is. That is our Yahweh. Now, so the people when they, okay. The people of God found different ways of referring to God. They would see his mighty acts. They would see all the great things that he did on their behalf. And they would, they would call him Yahweh plus another accompanying attribute depending on what they saw God do for them. For example, I'll give you some examples here. Moses, I'm sorry, Moses. Abraham, he was called on to sacrifice his one and only son, Isaac, right? And remember, Isaac came after around, what, 25 years of waiting? I mean, so talk about being the apple of Abraham's eye. And God tells him, you see that son that you really, really, really love? I want you to sacrifice him to me. And I don't know all of what Abraham possibly felt after being asked by God to do that, but he says, okay, gets Isaac, starts walking, is going up to offer him as a sacrifice. Isaac goes, Dad, where's, where's the... I don't see any animal here. And you know what Abraham tells him? What does he tell him? The Lord, Yahweh, will provide. Yahweh, Yireh or Jehovah Jireh, right? The Lord will provide. And did the Lord provide? Yeah. Right before he would slay him, oh, almost fell. Right before he would slay him, he stops his hand, and then in the thicket there is a ram. He says, see that ram right there? Whoa, where did that come from? (laughs) Doesn't matter, okay? You offer that as a sacrifice. The Lord will provide. There's another one. There's several more. Yahweh Rapha, the Lord that heals Appearing after the song of Miriam in Exodus chapter 15, he says, if you listen to my voice, I will, I, I will prevent these diseases from touching you because I am the Lord, your healer. In Exodus chapter 17, Yahweh Nisi, which means the Lord, my banner or my victory. Now, this story is one of my favorites in all of the Old Testament. Okay? It is where Joshua, being the commander of the armed forces, if you will, okay, is fighting against the Amalekite nation. Okay? And it is where as long as Moses would hold up his staff, the Israelites would win. And when he would drop it, the others would gain ground. And so, so his, his buddies would help hold up his arm, and then eventually Joshua and the fighters of Israel overcome the Amalekites. And, and that's where we see this name, Yahweh Nisi. The Lord is my victory. He is my banner. Yahweh Mekodishkem. I don't know if that's how you say it. I don't know Hebrew very well, by the way, okay? So Hebrew scholars in here, please correct me later, okay? Exodus 31 and Leviticus 20, we find this. He says, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Yahweh mekodeshkem, I am the Lord that sanctifies you. Yahweh shalom. Anybody know what shalom means in here? (sighs) The Lord, God is my peace. Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. Yahweh Ra, the Lord my shepherd, like we read this morning. What we see is God, a God who gets involved in human affairs, a God who loves his people, his chosen people, that he's willing to get down in the dirt with them. He is willing to be for them all that he needs to be for them. He is. I am. And he always will be. He provided food for them in the desert. I totally forgot about my slides here. Sorry about that. Look at that. He provided food for them in the desert. Water, remember, out of a rock, okay? Even a lamb for the offering. He healed their diseases. He fought their battles for them and drove out their enemies in front of them. He provided peace and strength and guidance. Well, what about for his people today? What about for us? Is Yahweh going to supply all of our needs too? Yeah. Yes, God, he will be his covenant God. He will be the covenant God for his covenant people. Always. 
just as he was for his people in the Old Testament that lived under the Old Covenant. He is Yahweh God for us today. That hasn't changed, brothers and sisters, and it is not going to change. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Now, how do we know this? I want to refer you to a few passages here. If you go to John 8 and verse 58, let's go over there for a minute. <clears throat> John chapter 8 and verse 58. At least at the time. And I chuckle when I read this because, I mean, it is... Jesus obviously is the master of everything, right? But I, I think he was also the master of really getting on people's nerves, on the people that, whose nerves needed to be gotten onto, <laughs> right? He's in this back and forth with, with a bunch of Jews. Some of them are scribes and some of them are Pharisees, okay? And they're talking about Abraham, their father, and they're saying, we are descendants of Abraham, and they take great pride in that. Well, this is Jesus' response at the end of that back and forth. Look at what he says in verse 58. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And how do you think they responded to that? How dare you? You what? Right? I mean, they'd heard enough, right? And it, it, the, what follows is possibly the greatest understatement of all time. Look at what it says. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Okay? <laughs> throw, throw at him. They weren't like tossing it at him. Hey, here, Jesus, catch, right? Throw at him. Why? They wanted him gone. They wanted him dead. In their minds, he was committing blasphemy. He was equating himself with God, and that is punishable by death. But Jesus made no bones about it. He told them the truth. He said, hey, I am. I am the God of Abraham, the father of the faith, in whom you take so much pride, in whose lineage you take so much pride and joy. I am his God, and I am your God too. Man. See, Jesus is Yahweh. We have these several I am statements of Jesus. He says, I am the bread of life, and I am the water that gives life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. Enter through me, he says. I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. Hear, Shema, listen to my voice. They know me. I am the resurrection. In the life, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. Remain in me, abide in me, and you will bear much fruit. And you remember what happened at Jesus' transfiguration? When he was accompanied by Moses on the one side, and Elijah on the other side, uh, 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 as, as a symbol of, of the law, and the fulfillment of the law, and the prophets. You can barely see them. They are shining so bright. And Peter goes, you know what we really need right now? We need a tent. And you know what the voice from the clouds says to him? Hey, this is my son. Listen to him. Not just hear what he's saying. Not just, okay, let it go through one ear and out the other. It's, it's nice to hear him talk. No, he's saying he's got something to tell you. So listen. Pay attention to my son because he is, I am. He is Yahweh. What does this mean for us today? It means that God loves us, his covenant people. We are his people now. And in the same way that he was for the Israelites back then, he is for us today and he will be for us tomorrow. He is the God who loves us so deeply and so intimately that he will be for us what he needs, what we need him to be for us. He is that God who supplies all of our needs. He is that God who's able to do increasingly, abundantly more than anything we could ever ask or imagine. There is no need that you have today that Yahweh cannot supply. None. None. You, you think about your marriage, you think about your career, you think about the future. Man, sometimes aren't we racked with anxiety because we have these needs and we don't know how they're going to be fulfilled. Well, Yahweh, I am, he says, 
He is and he will be for his people what they need him to be as he always has been. So if there's one thing I want you all to take away from this morning, if nothing else, is to rest assured that God is, that Yahweh, our personal God, right? Our God who is knowable, that he is and that he loves you and that he cares for you. And I hope that knowledge of his love for his people will give you peace.